sleep. It had been 10 years, actually 16 years since I left Texas, 10 years since earning my PhD studying the influence of forest fires on the atmosphere, 10 years of living along the shores of Lake Erie, but this was my first time being out in the Great Lakes. And not only was I sailing them, but I was sailing them aboard a replica of War of 1812 tall ship, the Niagara. I would be awake for 36 hours. <laughs> and possibly because of the delirium associated with being awake for so long. <laughs> um, I had a question that kept coming into my mind, like the waves striking the wooden hull of the boat. <clears throat> I kept thinking about everything that I had seen, heard, and read about plastic pollution in the oceans, the most infamous collection of which is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. What does the middle of this garbage patch look like? Water. It just looks like water. And yet, out of here, we can pull all of this I kept wondering what we would see, what we would find in the Great Lakes. I didn't realize it at this point in time, <laughs> but this is one of those moments in your life where you change directions. Gone was the woman from Texas who studied forest fires in Montana, <laughs> and instead I was embarking upon a new career as a plastic pollution researcher. My hope here, talking with you today, is that I could get you to reevaluate your relationship with plastic. So what exactly is plastic? The main component of plastic is a polymer. These are modeled off of naturally occurring polymers, things like our hair, our skin, our very DNA, but they're synthetic. They're made from fossil fuels. A polymer is kind of like a train, how it's composed of these individual cars that are linked together to make the bigger train. A polymer is made of individual monomers, like for example here I'm showing polyethylene, is composed of these ethylene monomers that we link together through the polymerization process to make our polymer. But plastic isn't just the polymer. It's actually a mixture. So mixed in with the polymer, we have things like plasticizers that allow it to be molded, UV stabilizers to protect it from the sunlight, colorants so that we can have plastic in every color of the rainbow, flame retardants so they don't spontaneously combust when we use them, that's a big concern, <laughs> and other additives that also aid in its moldability. And I've used this word moldable twice because it's actually one of the features of plastic that make it so attractive from an industrial standpoint. You can make anything from a baby doll to buttons to a bottle of water all from the same material. And that makes it really unique when it comes to material science. It's also lightweight, so transporting it is quite easy. And it's durable, so it won't break down along the way. Somewhat ironically, these same product properties that make it so attractive from an industrial standpoint are of concern when it comes to the environment. It's lightweight, so it can be carried to every facet of our planet, and you find it everywhere. It's durable. It's durable because, in fact, it doesn't undergo the same um, process of decomposition that most natural materials do. It doesn't biodegrade. That is, that there are very few organisms that can use it as a food source, and so it doesn't get turned back into soil the way natural materials would. Instead, it undergoes a process called photodegradation. So as sunlight makes it more brittle and cars drive over it and the action of wind and water act on it, it'll break into smaller and smaller pieces. But the polymers, those polymers that we were talking about earlier, very little is happening in terms of them with regard to their chemistry. So even as these pieces get smaller and smaller and smaller, it's still plastic. It still isn't going away. As a material, it was originally created the dawn of the 20th century, but it wasn't until World War II that the infrastructure for the mass production of plastics took place. 
And when the war movement ended, industry turned its attention to us, to the consumer. This is an iconic 1955 Time Life magazine ad called Throwaway Living. And it's used to really mark this transition in our society from one of reusing materials to one of disposability. Just throw it away. Because after all, disposable items cut down on household chores. Why wash that cup when you can just throw it out when you're done with it? Right? <laughs> yeah. But remember, this is a material that doesn't go away. Even when you throw it out, it's still there. But as a result of this transition and this marketing, you see the exponential increase in plastics production after World War II. To the point in 2014, when the most recent numbers are out, we were producing over 300 million tons of this material. This material that doesn't go away. It's all still here. All of it. Somewhere. Where is it? Sadly, increasingly, we're finding it in our water. As an area of scientific research, this really started in the world's oceans. But in 2004, a United Nations report came out that 80% of what we find in the world's oceans is coming from land. So that proverbial plastic bag you see blowing in the wind, well, it makes its way into a river, which flows to a lake, and all bodies of water flow into the ocean. So the plastic is making its way to the oceans through freshwater systems. And we live on the largest freshwater ecosystem in the entire world. People are dying for water, and it's our backyard. In 2012, we decided to do the first investigation for plastic pollution in the Great Lakes, the open waters of the Great Lakes. We started up in Lake Superior. We sailed down into Lake Huron and then into Lake Erie. The next year, 2013, we did a second expedition in Lake Erie, as well as Lake Ontario and Lake Michigan. So between the two years, I've sailed and <laughs> swam in. Um, and also have data on plastic pollution within all five of the Great Lakes. At the very beginning of the Great Lakes chain, right, Lake Superior flows into Lake Huron. And in these relatively pristine environments, we already find an average of 7,000 plastic particles per square kilometer. Now remember, this material is not natural, so we should be finding nothing and we're already finding 7,000. In Lake Michigan, that count goes up to 17,000. In Lake Erie, 46,000. And the waters from Lake Erie flow into Lake Ontario, the last step in the Great Lakes chain before they flow out to the northern Atlantic Ocean. What do we see here? A quarter of a million plastic particles per square kilometer. 230,000 plastic particles per square kilometer. This rivals the abundance that we find in the most polluted parts of the world's oceans. And this is our backyard. This is our water. The water that we are the caretakers of. But it wasn't just the sheer numbers that really shocked us. It was also the size. 75% of the plastics that we find in the Great Lakes are less than one millimeter in diameter. Incredibly tiny, like a period at the end of a sentence. They're so small that when you go out to the lake, which hopefully you will after hearing today's talk, and you look at the water, you're going to think, I don't see any plastic. You won't. They're so small that you don't see them. But they're there. And that makes them even more scary in my mind. <laughs> the vast majority of these pieces of plastic are fragments. 
things that broke down from something that was larger, like the kid's sand pail that gets left behind when you go out to the beach um, on a Sunday. Second to those fragments are pellets, these rounded pieces of plastic that we find in many of our consumer products, things like body washes, face washes, toothpastes. One of my uh, colleagues was telling me backstage about how he went to get his hair washed, or his hair cut, and uh, they washed it and the shampoo had microbeads in it. So these are included in these consumer products and they wash down the drain and our research has established that they make their way through wastewater treatment plants and end up in our water. And then we pull them out of the Great Lakes. But why do we care? All right, so there's plastic in the water. Why does that matter? Well, it goes back to what I talked about at the very beginning of the presentation where I said plastic is a mixture. Embedded within the plastic are these chemicals, plasticizers, flame retardants, and other additives that are in the plastic but are not chemically bound, and so they can leach out. As the plastic is in the water, it actually provides a really nice surface for lots of other chemicals too. Things like PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, which were banned in the 1970s because of their known human health impacts, but they're still in the water. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which come raining down from the sky into our Great Lakes. These stick to the outside, and so the pl plastic actually becomes like little poison pills. And remember how small these little poison pills are. They're so incredibly tiny that they can be easily ingested by organisms at the very base of the food chain, zooplankton. And they can be carried through these organisms up the food chain and ultimately into us, carrying those chemicals all along the way. So why should we care? Because ultimately, we are water. Our planet is 70% water, our bodies are 70% water, and I don't think that's coincidence. Our skin kind of creates this illusion that somehow we are separated from our environment, but we're not. If it's in the water, it's in us. So now that I've thoroughly depressed you, um, <laughs> what can we do, right? What can we do about this? What are some solutions? And ultimately, it comes back to what I asked you to do at the very beginning, or what I hope that you get out of this talk. I want us to reevaluate our relationship with single-use disposable plastics and eliminate them. And there are some really easy steps that we can do. Because ultimately, everything that we find in the water comes back to us, right? So how do we do this? How do we eliminate single-use disposable plastic? Well, you can change what you buy. So I don't know if any of you have been faced with this quandary, but this happens every time I go to the grocery store. I'm faced with the option of buying organic bananas wrapped in plastic versus conventional bananas that are not. <laughs> it's a difficult decision because I like to buy organic. I do believe I vote with my money. But the reality is I can change what I buy and I refuse to buy things that are over-packaged in plastic. I refuse it. Shake the habit of plastic bags. So you go to the grocery store. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, it was, you know, paper or plastic. Now there's not even an option. It's just plastic. I made a commitment to myself five years ago that I would never take another plastic bag. If that means I have to carry everything out in my arms, well, that's what I do. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, but most of the time now, I've trained myself, right, where I remember my reusable bags and I bring them with me. I made a similar commitment to ban bottled water. It's not cleaner, it's not healthier. Don't buy it, <laughs> just don't buy it. It doesn't matter, I have a 16 year old, she will beg me, she will tell me she's dying if I do not buy her a bottle of water. She hasn't died yet, it's okay. <laughs> I won't buy it. I remember my reusable mug every time I leave the house, and when she's begging me for bottled water, I tell her, well, why didn't you think about this before we left the house? 
<laughs> I bring my reusable mug everywhere to the point where everyone teases me about it. You know, I have this permanent thermos with me. Um, my mug can, can hold coffee, tea, and water. It's amazing. Whatever beverage I want. Straws. <sighs> when I tell people what I do, inevitably they tell me about how they, they, they've seen the videos of, of straws being pulled out of turtles' noses. Um, straws suck. There's no other way of saying it. They do. Um, I have metal straws that I keep in my purse, in my backpack, if I really need a straw. You know, but I also order all of my beverages, no straw, please. I'd like some water, no straw, please. I'd like an orange juice, no straw, please. It just, it just rolls off of my mouth now. Utensils, you know, this, we're getting to summertime and everyone's going to have their backyard barbecues. I bring my own. I have a pair that I keep clipped to my purse. I have another pair that I keep in my backpack. You know, so you just bring your own stuff so that you don't have to use the plasticware. So these are really easy solutions for each of us to do. We are the problem when it comes to plastic pollution, but the nice aspect of that is that also means that we are the solution. So that by refusing disposable plastic, you, me, we can be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you.